Welcome along to another live episode of Red Tinted Glasses and it's Monday afternoon. We're coming to you slightly earlier than usual due to uh, a change in both our schedules um, this evening, but it does mean that Callum is back on the show. Just a few things to talk about today, Callum. Welcome back. Thank you. Is it working? You can hear me, Glenn, just to confirm after the last time we tried to do this. Yes, can still hear you, can still see you for those that are tuning in on YouTube as well. So all systems seem to be go. Um, morning to Mark Robertson, of course, joining us from America. Good evening, I suppose, to any of our Australian followers um, tuning into this episode as well. Um, Calm circuses tend to last longer when they come down the beach. But it's the other side of Broadhill we see the circuses, not at AB24. But Neil Warnock's reign as Aberdeen manager did come to um, an end after 33 days in charge. 250 grand was the rumoured figure he was supposed to be getting. Um, I think slightly less now that he's departed earlier um, than predicted. But he does go out after guiding the Dons to Hamden, a weekend victory over Kilmarnock, seeing the Dons return for another semi-final this season. Lots to chat about. We'll go over that game <coughs> at, at the weekend. Season ticket prices, because I know you're a man that has plenty to say on season tickets. And of course, the club have finally broken their silence on Neil Warnock's departure as well. We'll discuss the statement released this morning from the club. And still on on the pitch, we'll go back to discussing the midweek trip to Dens Park. So lots to get through. Bet you're glad you've come back for this one, Callum. Yep, I just hope the internet uh, holds up because uh, <laughs> otherwise you could just be ranting uh, for, for another hour. But this time more probably about off the field matters rather than on the field. So at least there's that. Yeah, I know. Well, there's uh, once again lot, lots to talk about and quite... Uh, ironic that if your internet's unstable, it very much describes the goings on at Pataudry as well. So we've got a lot to cram into the show today. Where do you want to start, first of all? Um, I suppose the very odd news that sort of ruined, well, not ruined my good mood, but just confused <laughs> me on Saturday. And uh, Neil Warnock resigning. Um, very odd, very bizarre, I felt like. Um, and unexpected. And then a meltdown ensued on, on BBC Radio Scotland. <laughs> yeah, Michael Stewart in particular seeming to really come to terms, uh, struggle to come to terms with the news that an interim manager was only uh, interim. And um, yeah, the West Coast media in particular loving life for the fact that we were <clears throat> particularly struggling, um, I guess, as fans to kind of come to terms with the news um, uh, as well. And I think... Interestingly enough, I, I guess the news of Warnock's departure really overshadowed what was on the pitch an uh, encouraging performance and an excellent result as well when I think most of us will have probably gone in with hope rather than expectation going into the game at the weekend. But slight slight surprise given Warnock's departure. It seemed to be discussed with the club regardless um, of victory on Saturday that Neil would have departed the club. It was decided to the players and um, staff on Thursday um, that, that, that this decision was coming. So I'm glad that he's gone out on a high uh, in terms of taking us back to Hamden. Um, but, you know, he also delivered a few home truths in his final post-match press conference, speaking about the fact that the club need to get recruitment correct. And um, without doing that, we're going to struggle We've got the right infrastructure to be challenging the top two. Um, you know, some people say he chucked it um, because he wasn't getting the results in the league. But, you know, he certainly seemed to indicate an imminent arrival for a new manager, but very much contradicts what the club have come out with this morning anyway. Yeah, if I'm honest, I'm still a little bit confused about the whole Neil Warnock thing. And I, I also realised this morning, I feel sorry for Junior Hoylet uh, having come <laughs> in to work with Neil Warnock and then he's gone after a month. Um, but yeah, you certainly. I certainly got the impression. If I messaged you after after the statement came out, thinking, oh, maybe we'll hear rumours or or the press will get wind of actual names come sort of Monday, and then I was hoping, and um, maybe the new manager will be in the stands on Wednesday against Dundee. However, no, and um, Warnock sort of suggested it seemed like that we were a lot. It was going to be more imminent, and then the statement, the fact we were in advanced talks. 
also then sort of got my hopes up a little bit. But then the statement coming out today saying that will be the international break. Um, so very, very bizarre. Peter leaving back in the dugout. And by the end of the season, we've had four different managers in, in the dugout, essentially. <laughs> uh, one under, well, two will be two under permanent and then two sort of interims. Um, well, which, that we know of. <laughs> yes, that's true. Unless it goes really, really tits up in the split. <laughs> Um, but it's, you know, that just points towards the fact that clearly the club aren't being run correctly at the moment because nobody, unless you're Watford, uh, should be going through <laughs> that many managers in a season. Yeah, I know. We're, are we just the Scottish Watford um, now? And I, I did see someone say, would we be, become the first team to potentially win the Scottish Cup having been managed by three different managers? Um from the start of the competition to, to the end. So um, something to keep an eye on between now and then. And of course, you know, we want to be speaking about matters on the pitch, Callum, but <laughs> this club right now seems to be giving us more to talk about off the pitch rather than on it. And I think, you know, the departure of Neil Warnock coupled with what he said versus what the club said um, just kind of further, you know, backs up that we're a complete shambles off the pitch right now. And, by all accounts, the to, to quote the club statement, the holistic review of our football operation has been near enough completed and the audit's been reviewed with the, the guy that's done it and, and the board of directors. And they've identified three key areas to, and I quote, substantially enhance our current setup. The, the first being certain structural changes within the football setup. Mm. For me, that kind of seems to indicate maybe more of a academy first team look. Um, <clears throat> second, and most glaringly obvious to the fans, it doesn't really need to take a, you know, recruitment consultant or whatever they're calling them to work out. We need to recruit a new first team manager. And the addition of a new technical director to support the director of football. Um, I can see your hands in there. You want to jump in there? What's the difference between a technical director and a director of football? And I swear half of these things didn't, half these job titles we hear these days didn't exist like five years ago. Um, and now we're, we're getting this. And surely the fact we're getting in a technical director suggests uh, the model or with the current director of football isn't working, in which case are we replacing him or are we not probably not it's very oh, very not. very odd um and it could almost be a case of too many cooks spoil the broth you almost sort of feel like as well especially if some of them aren't very good at their good at their jobs which um would be a concern really wouldn't it yeah and <clears throat> barry reed points out that the club report points out we need a, a technical director this will surely just add on more time with a managerial appointment and yeah. again, we're doing things completely wrong because we're going to appoint a manager in the next two weeks who is going to have to work or report to, again, going by what the club have come out, he will report to the technical director and the director of football, which mm. currently and looks like is set to remain as Stephen Gunn. What manager wants to come in and not know who they are directly reporting to? That just yeah. seems madness. You would surely appoint the technical director first before you then appoint the manager. Probably, no wonder Warnock's gone, fuck this. He's probably mm -hmm. seen kind of the structure and goes, well, I don't want to be part of that. Yeah, possibly. Um, I mean, there, there are a lot of sort of theories about about why Neil Warnock left. And to be honest, I, I, I'm none the wiser. Um and I don't know, maybe we've been unfair to, to Stephen Gunn. Maybe there is just too much on it on his plate and that's the need for the technical director. But Understand. I don't really know what the difference between the two roles really are. Um, I guess, well, I hope it'll all come clear. But with the way things have gone in the last few years, um, I, there's sort of no indication to, to suggest that that would be the case, that w it will be clear to all of us. Um, but I guess regardless, let's hope it works out because we can't afford for the next managing appointment to go tits up um, because this last, well, the last four, I guess, now really have. Um, so they really, we've said this the past few times, they really need to get this one right. 
Um, mm-hmm. And I suppose it is encouraging that they've actually taken someone with experience of doing these kind of reviews and looking at improvements as well. Um, so there's credit for that. But at the same time, with this statement, I'm still a little bit a little bit confused about what the hell is going on. Yeah, it's it's really not kind of clear, um, kind of the structure, and it won't be clear to a lot of us. In terms of the guy that actually did the the whole review, for those of you on on Twitter more specifically, um, check out the thread that the football commentator Derek Ray has done on the the guy himself. Um, he's obviously had a lot of experience working in German football, German hockey as well, and it's kind of spoke about the transformation that he helped provide to Hoffenheim. I think he was kind of involved in discovering Julian Nagelsmann. Um, If he discovers the next Julian Nagelsmann for Aberdeen, then we're we're totally laughing. But um, yeah, what what manager wants to come in under a premise of having to work for somebody or who's coming in in that technical director role and be like, well, I don't want him as manager. Mm. Kind of the the two don't add up. I think as many people are pointing out, Johnny Main here saying that we'll probably have a new manager before the tech director is appointed, which um is arse about face. And yeah, it look it's just back to front way of Dave Cormack's world, and we're all just living in it right now. But mm. for me, in terms of a technical director, the technical director needs to be somebody with footballing knowledge and needs yeah. to understand. Probably the Scottish game, um, as well as maybe the wider European market as well in terms of when it comes to scouting. Um, but probably most importantly, um, cannot be a yes man to Dave Cormack, um, mm. which we all believe Stephen Gunn to be. Um, and again, this is a role in, in a roundabout way, maybe not the, the title that we would have given it, a role that us as fans could see somebody with footballing know-how an understanding of the game to come in and assist Stephen Gunn. Yeah. But yet we've got him reporting to Stephen Gunn. So someone that will be experienced and should know the game is going to have to report to somebody who has basically learned on the job. And well, certainly Neil Warnock was very scathing about the recruitment and how much Stephen Gunn is involved in that obviously kind of remains to be seen a little bit. I know questions should maybe be directed more at the head of recruitment or, or mm-hmm. on that, but obviously Stephen and the rest of the board sign off on these players. Yeah. I mean, the fact, uh, just since we were talking about um, the, uh, the the review and their German background, um, it sort of just reminded me of, of something I read, I think it was yesterday, about Mark Fotheringham, uh, about how he's worked under Felix McGath and he reckons he's got, you know, more credentials than... Um, He's worked on the younger Klinsman as well, I suppose. He's uh, got more credentials than, than than the last three managers for us, or sorry, prior to Warnock. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, perhaps maybe we do go down that path if we're sticking down this German route. Uh, I'd like it just for the accent changes in, in the interviews alone. <laughs> um, but right now, some of the managers we've seen links, I'm not too keen on really any of them. No, um, de- definitely not. Um... Michael O'Neill seems to be one that is picking up momentum. And um, with an obviously, international break, that would make sense as well. Yeah, I mean, I think slightly guided by the wild WhatsApp rumours of, of Aberdeen that, that do the round, on, especially on Sunday nights. Um, the fact that allegedly he was not wanting to come in until he'd taken care of the two friendlies that Northern Ireland have got lined up this month, coupled with the fact, of course, he was at Paisley for the the recent game against St Mirren, not accounting for the fact that St Mirren currently have two Northern Ireland internationals or players on the periphery of their um, squad. Um, But such as the world of football and rumours, two and two becomes five very quickly uh, and things like this gather momentum. The other couple of things, though, that I did take away from that that statement... um, Again, one of the key changes Burrow's saying is the priority is the engagement of the first team manager. Just the, the word choice and engagement really kind of made me laugh because I would have thought it would have been appointment of the first team manager. Um, we've identified a short list of individuals that meet the criteria agreed by the club and individuals who have also expressed an interest in the job. So again, kind of goes against what Neil Warnock's saying where he believed the club were kind of further along 
uh, and appointment was imminent. Um, I've certainly heard from a fairly reliable person about the, the kind of software that the club use in terms of hiring players, um, kind of like you and your football manager database, I guess, um, where you put in a couple of um, keywords maybe or, or stuff you're looking for. Anyway, this managerial software produced the HJK Helsinki manager uh, as an ideal candidate for our job. Um, but uh, and there was another name, but um, I've not been told what that other name was. But but Cormac said no to no to both. So hmm. um, interesting to see what the auto computer conjures up for us um, in that sense. Yeah. But are we using <laughs> AI to hire our next manager? Is that, is that what's going on? <laughs> oh, um, hopefully, it goes better than Kensington Palace. <laughs> Yes, true. I mean, hopefully, uh, if it goes better than my football manager saves well as you reference, then uh, that would be really quite something. I mean, 2031 and won four league titles uh, on the bounce to Aberdeen, so uh, they'd be doing really well. Might as well to, chuck your CV in, to be honest. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And um, that'd be a laugh, I'm sure, if people want to still go down that route as, as we did before or not. Well, uh, again, you know, the club confirming that the interviews will be taking place and um, this week in some cases the, the clubs will be looking to seek permissions for managers currently under contract again that sort of references michael o'neill currently under contract with with northern ireland of course uh, i have heard from somebody that has done podcast interviews before with neil lennon uh, as well that the club have spoken to neil lennon um about the vacant um, managerial position um and you'll have seen the dm that came into our page about that as well um but i have to say i would <clears throat> be very surprised if the club went down the, the lennon route purely due to the divisive nature um that that appointment would make unless you believe half the folk plz soccer and sky sports managed to interview after the game at the weekend I let's not believe them um it I, 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 I don't know I mean it the fact that Neil Lennon's even been mentioned we only seem to be getting managers linked with Neil in their name but we had Neil Warnock Michael <laughs> O'Neill Alex Neil's been chucked around and Neil Lennon um make it a point my dad if you don't want me at least <laughs> you just come in as assistant but yeah exactly I forgot to take the filter of Neil off the, the database search and that's why all these guys keep coming up um another thing that's kind of been shoehorned out and kind of overshadowed again by the the warnock news the victory at the weekend was the club released season ticket prices on thursday column um a slight price increase which uh, again given the current state of affairs on the pitch um seemed difficult to swallow for some um fair play to anna murison who emailed the club and actually asked if championship pricing will apply if the situation uh, arises and the club saying um, that that will be dealt with uh, accordingly. Mm. Um, good to see the ticket officing staff are very much assured that we will remain a Premiership club next season. Um, yeah, unlikely event. Have they seen the league table? Have they? <laughs> yeah. um, given the price increase, I think it works out actually between 3 to 5% for most fans, um, as long as you're renewing or you're certainly same seat, maybe if you move stand, it could go up slightly more. Um, what was pointed out to me actually last week, though, of course, is the Don's cash scheme, the kind of cash back you get when you purchase a new top or anything out of the club shop. So if you've got a significant build up in your Don's cash account, that could probably counter any price increase you've got on your season ticket, something I certainly hadn't considered before I was away to start my rant about a price increase. So I quickly piped down couple of key incentives though um for those um certainly with young children free under 12 season tickets in the family area only of the upper deck um regardless of that being just assigned to the one section in the upper deck great to see the club going out and looking to secure a, a younger fan base to to get them in um rory certainly threw a tantrum when i said i wasn't taking him at the weekend so i'm certainly looking up to you know, certainly get him a first season ticket next season as well. And, you know, just £49 for somewhere like the main stand. I think that's excellent pricing as well. Um, but Callum, you do have a gripe because student prices once again have not been introduced for next season. They haven't. And I'm sure 
there was murmurs that Burroughs was going to look to introduce it for this season. Um, I don't know if I've made that up now at this point, Glenn. Do you recall such a thing? Um, I certainly feel like he said it would be looked into. Yeah. Clearly, they didn't look into it that much. Um, <laughs> you know, people will have things to say. Um, you know, students, get a job, whatever. I ha- I have a job. <laughs> Look, I have a job. But unfortunately, university means then I can't work full-time uh, as well. Um, but, you know, they can also say, like, you know, a lot of students will fall into the 18 to 21 category. Not everyone does. Some of us mm-hmm. are mature students and are still hampered by the fact that they can't really work full-time uh, alongside university so i think it's really silly that they don't have that option even if it was for certain sections of the ground they don't need to do it in the main stand they could just have it in like the south and the and well, i suppose the red shed it's probably cheap enough anyway but in in the richard donald as well and um, it's potentially pricing people out when they're you know they're not going to be season ticket sales aren't going to be flying in at the moment are they when perhaps that could be an incentive to people and especially when it's such a big university say two universities and mm-hmm. um, both big sponsors of 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 the club as well so if, if they feel like that something could have been worked out with their um odd bizarre and um, thankfully the increases are, aren't massive um, mm-hmm. but you know when we're going to germany uh, this summer as well and um, <laughs> You know, as I've got to sort of budget very accordingly, so it might be pot noodles and, and pesto pasta uh, and uh, for for the foreseeable, unfortunately. Yeah, shame you've left Nando's and there's going to be no free chicken for you. Um, well, <laughs> well, if I stay at my new place, which you will not mention, <laughs> then um, you know maybe I'll I'll get a discount there, which will, which will help nicely. Well, you could say every little helps, I suppose, but that's not mentioning any names. Um, <laughs> the good thing is that the early bird pricing um, is in fact fe- is in effect until the tenth of June, and your current season ticket seat is being held until the end of May. Um, I think it's the week after the Scottish Cup final. So again, for those like ourselves going to Germany or needing to budget, at least the early bird price for me certainly feels longer than than last season. Um, Anyway, yeah. and of course, the, the club do have the um, six-month and 10-month finance options on your season ticket as well, although I think the 10-month one does end at the end of April, I want to say. Um, but yeah, at least there's a couple of options. You don't have to pay everything up front. Yeah, there is that. I do like the fact that they do have those finance options. It just helps spread the cost and makes it mm. a little bit easier, I think, um, for several people. But uh, student prices, Burrows, come on. <laughs> Not happening. <laughs> um, right, we've spoken a lot about off-the-pitch matters then, Callum. Let's speak about on-the-pitch because Scottish Cup semi-final awaits. Positivity beckons, finally, a 2-1, no, 3-1 victory over mm-hmm. Kilmarnock um, at the weekend. It was two changes, that's where I was going with that. Uh, to the starting lineup as Duke and Jensen dropped out from the disappointing late defeat to St Mirren, Jack McKenzie and Jamie McGrath coming in instead. Thoughts on those changes? And of course, we're back at Hamden, baby. Fine, changes were fine. They worked. Uh, I um, I don't I don't even know what to did. Didn't even know what to do with myself on on Saturday after a win. I was in a good mood and it felt very odd. Um, but. I thought to a man, they were all absolutely excellent. Never mind the two changes. They were all brilliant. Um, Jack McKenzie, very good for me. And I just quite like the fact he's actually putting in, you know, he's putting in decent performances and seems to be improving because it just, it just reminds me of sort of Andrew Considine where he came in and everyone's like, man, and then he proved everybody wrong. And I hope the same <laughs> happens. Um, but I was impressed with him. Killian Phillips uh, as well. I thought the application of him, uh, over the week, uh, over the weekend was absolutely excellent, and I feel like a lot of the team probably had those comments from Neil Warnock in mind about how we got bullied down there, because mm-hmm. we certainly didn't get bullied on Saturday. If anything, we bullied them. And um, however, we've been critical of Graham Shinney previously in the past. My man of the match, absolutely excellent, absolutely everywhere, fighting for mm-hmm. every ball. Um, grabbed the goal as well on his weak foot, something that he sometimes barely even stands on too. Um, obviously <laughs> had the deflection, but 
Oh, it was just nice to win. Everyone played well. No complaints from me. And the pie was pretty decent too. So delighted. That really helped my hangover little self as well. Yeah, no, I actually um, had a pie as well for the first time this season. £4.10 though, fucking hell. Like, it's extortionate, yeah, it is extortionate. But Even student would... prices for pies, guys, come on. <laughs> <laughs> You're not asking for much, but um, no, the um, steak pie was uh, was really good. Um, definitely worth the, worth the money, but yeah, it did feel robbed at paying £5.50 for a steak pie in a Yorkie. Like, but at least on the pitch, we had lots of positives um, to speak about. You mentioned Graham Shinney. We are going to come on to um, his booking a, a little bit later on, and obviously that booking does mean um, that he is now um, suspended for the semi-final. But another mm. player for me that impressed, and as you said, you feel a bit sorry for, Junior Hoylett. Um, I thought he was exceptional. Um, you mentioned Shinney being your man of the match. The sponsors actually gave Junior the man of the match. Um, involved in all three goals as Paul Donaldson says um, the only thing I hope we look at between now and certainly Dundee is that we get Junior Hoylett on corners rather than Connor Barron passing it to Graham Shinney and then back again to, to whip in a ball just get someone that actually has a bit of quality about them mm -hmm. to whip in balls in, into the box yeah, certainly. But no, Junior Hoylet, Hoylet as well for me, very exciting. Sort of every time you got the ball, you were you know excited about seeing what was going to happen. The nutmeg in the second half was mm, just yeah. phenomenal. And I thought he actually linked up with Jack McKenzie really well. Jack McKenzie got up with that left-hand side in support of him quite a lot, and, and it worked. Um, so if we can see a little bit more of that from Junior Hoylet, uh, I would be delighted. Um, and hopefully that will cheer him up after his pals left. Um, probably early to talk about this, Glenn. I know we've got a lot to get through, but I'm going to mention it anyway. If he keeps performing like this, even at his age, would you like to see him next season? <clears throat> well, I mean, he's a winger, and is, we're certainly lacking um, mm -hmm. in that. Bit of experience as well. I think it would be, if the wages were right, it would be a deal that would probably suit both parties. Um, for those of you that listen to most of our episodes will have heard the the kind of getting to know you episode we did with Junior Hoylet and of course the, the World Cup coming up in 2026 being in Canada as well as America and Mexico I'm sure Junior is kind of hoping to probably be that last swan song there so if I guess the, the deal would have to be right for both parties I, I wouldn't want us to be spending too much wages on someone like Junior Hoylet as you say given the kind of age and probably lacking in pace Um but experience probably going to be a key factor to this team going into next season and the likelihood of losing some quite influential figures. It would make sense, but it obviously has to work for, for both parties. So yeah. one that I'm sure if performances continued on the, the same level as we saw um, against Kilmarnock, I think fans would get on board of, but I guess how is he going to react now that his best mate's not here? Yeah, true. But if you knew about the news on Saturday and putting that kind of performance, then then that's okay. And I suppose true. also the type of type of guy with that sort of experience, um, that could be very very beneficial for the likes of Shaden Morris. Should he still be here, Vicente Pasquale, or any other sort of younger prospective wingers that we might see next season? Yeah, that's true. You could take the wingers under his wing, quite literally. Um, and look, yeah, and look to develop them on. And um, Kevin Blanchard picking up on the performance and kind of going back to what you mentioned about everyone being up for the the battle and the kind of physical element. I thought it was quite interesting listening to Derek McInnes post match saying that he knew he would kind of be going route one, balls over the top. Um, but I thought we dealt with that a lot better. We spoke about um, having Killian Phillips in the team when Jay Moyer was on the last episode, giving us that little bit of height uh, in the team, giving us kind of a target rather than just Miofsky. And I think that physical battle kind of helped us. And Killy looked really rattled um, at, at times with the first goal as well from a Kilmarnock point of view, we'll be absolutely really disappointed with. Um, very easy from an Aberdeen point of view. But for me, the first two goals, and obviously more so the third once I saw it back, kind of also was the luck that I've been calling out for us to kind of have. You know, the, the keeper spills the shot, the deflection that takes it above um, Will Dennis and goals for Graham Shinney's. We haven't been having that rub of the green in the league. And 
we've benefited from it in the Scottish Cup. If it's going to continue in the Scottish Cup and it sees us lifting the trophy in May, then I'm all here for it. But it just felt that things that hadn't been falling our way did so at the weekend. Yeah, certainly. But you sort of make your own luck, really, don't you? And True. I think, you know, with with the application of everyone sort of involved, things like that, we deserve that rub of the green. Um, I think, well, the deflections played a part in all of the goals, really, I guess. I suppose even at the end, mm-hmm. the first one, I think Julian Junior Hoyle shot took a little bit of a nick, which meant it was a bit more difficult for Dennis yeah. to deal with before um, McGrath tap, tapped home. But also... Got to give credit for Jamie McGrath for getting up there in support of Boyan and and getting involved and getting back amongst the goals as well. Um, mm. And if we can see, we sort of seem to say that every time he pops up with a goal or two, you just want him to keep sort of building that consistency. If he can do that towards the back end of the split and that confidence that you'll get uh, back in back into the season towards the splits, then that could be a massive help for us. Um, and we're score, scoring goals that weren't from Boyan Miofsky as well. More of that, please. That would be lovely. Although, if he wants to get back amongst the goals, the two then that would be nice. <laughs> yeah, but he's still playing his part in the goals as well. Um, obviously, especially the, the first goal as well. Um, it, towards the end of the first half, obviously, we concede a, a really um, poor goal. Um, <laughs> Fraser Wallace's quote to me on that still makes me laugh. Nicky Devlin stripped like the willow. Um, in terms of giving away the kind of getting twisted inside out as well. Connor Barron and Graham Shinney probably culpable for two players going for the same ball as well. And Neil Warnett must be thinking this Aberdeen team really can see the softest goals going because I think pretty much every goal we conceded during his time as Aberdeen manager was soft and in most cases avoidable as well. Jack McKenzie kind of bit ball watching, kind of getting distracted and uh, Danny Armstrong has a tap in and at that point calm I don't know about you in the the south stand um but it just kind of felt there was a little bit of a nervousness kind of brushed over Padre mm. and there was like a sense that let's just get into half time and not only the players but the fans can can regroup before going again because certainly once Kelly scored I felt there was a, a real nervousness around the ground yeah, I, I felt it too, and I'm sort of concerned with how things have gone most of this season, not in recent weeks, but recent weeks especially. Um, worried that the heads would go down a little bit uh, after conceding that goal, and and especially being such a soft goal, and and they might have been thinking, oh, here we go again, because that's sort of what I was thinking, but I was very glad to get in at half time and not concede two on the bounce, um, a la St Mirren. Mm-hmm. And I thought they actually responded pretty well in the second half. Um, and the goal, the third goal certainly came at a good time because, yeah. you know, it was, I think about it was 66 minutes. And if that goes on into the last sort of 20, 15 minutes where we've only got a one goal lead, that St. Mirren game certainly would have probably been creeping back into the players' minds and the fans. Yeah, so, I suppose. yeah I was just saying, certainly the, the fans mind. And I think, yeah, you're absolutely right because, you know, it was beginning to get to that kind of, stage of the game where McInnes was looking to to roll the dice and, and make a couple of changes um, and that goal for us just kind of just gave everybody that little bit of breathing space that little bit of okay right we've got that two goal cushion back and we can relax a little bit and kind of control the game in terms of our subs and also the pace of the play as well slow things down um, as well now of course Scottish football and controversial decisions are two things that seem to go hand in hand. And it's another weekend where refereeing decisions are very much at the forefront of attention. Um, Obviously, the decisions that came at Easter Road in particular. But it's fair to say John Beaton was also um, the victim of a lot of questionable decision making um, for our game. In particular, Donnelly uh, for Kilmarnock, how he managed to go through um, the entire game um, without a booking uh, is beyond me. Um, I guess the biggest kind of questionable decision was the one where Graham Shinney right at the end of the game is absolutely wiped out. Um, no free kick awarded and um, Graham Shinney gets booked for dissent in the end. Interesting to hear kind of what your opinion um, is on Graham Shinney getting himself booked in that because I think we can all agree 
that it is a booking and sorry a foul first and foremost and it should have been mm-hmm. given in the in the first place but when you are the captain of the side and probably aware himself that any booking gets yourself suspended for a semi-final should an experienced leader in Graham Cheney have been a bit more restrained in that situation easy of course for for me to say sitting here yeah, I think it's easy for us to say. I mean, the type of game Chinny was involved in as well. I think his his sort of tensions were just very high. Um, you know, he was getting involved in a lot, a lot of biting the tackles, his goal, and I mean, one hundred percent free kick. Mm-hmm. Maybe he doesn't need to go chasing after beating um, and to get that yellow card. However, also on the flip side, as well as the bad decision originally for not getting the free kick. Graham Cheney is also the captain, so he maybe should have got a bit of leeway there in that he, if anyone has the right to talk to him, he does. But obviously, we don't know what he said. Um, I think but... there's a difference, though, Callum, in talking to the ref and shouting in the referee's face. Well, look, if he wasn't such a shite, then it wouldn't have <laughs> happened. So, there we go. And I feel sorry for Graham Cheney. It could potentially hurt us massively in, in that semi-final as well. I think he maybe should know a little bit better, but I can certainly understand his frustrations just with... Sort of throughout the game, some of the refereeing decisions and also that one in particular, as blatant foul as you see <laughs> ever, basically. Yeah, I, I think, you know, you can see both sides of the coin uh, in the sense that it's, you know, the most blatant foul and, and that should have been given. But um, i kind of leaning a little bit more towards that he should have known better because if we look back to the Bonnie Rig game where he obviously picked up that booking as well, he got involved needlessly with the Bonnie Rig number 10, I'm pretty sure it was, and kind of chattering away and lulled himself into a really stupid foul um, that he probably shouldn't have given away. And again, a little bit of back chat, season booking, get get booked, and those two bookings has now led to a suspension. It's not also the, the first time that, that Graham Shane has now kind of got suspended ahead of a, a trip to Hamden as well. So mm. d- disappointing um, in that that sense. Um, from a, a, an Aberdeen point of view, um, but it's just one that I guess we're going to have to to learn from moving on. Yeah, uh, however, I do agree with Paul Donson's comment. Uh, the Rangers players did surround the referee and got a Hibs player sent off. I'm sure Connor Goldson went storming in, and I think Lundstrom mm. as well. Uh, none of them receiving any repercussions either, maybe because they they, they didn't dare to question uh, the referee. And, and, but I mean. <laughs> It's just inconsistency as well. And obviously, the Hibs player did get a red card, um, which, I mean, I suppose since I've mentioned it, <sighs> fucking hell. What chance have Hibs got in that in that <laughs> game? Oh, what chance have Hibs got? What chance the rest of us got? Because I think it also has been pointed out, John Beaton and Stephen McLean, who Stephen McLean is actually our referee for Wednesday night's trip to Dens Park, <laughs> are undoubtedly going to be involved in the semi-finals in some shape or form. Can't wait for that. And the worrying thing is, is now this might sound bad, but I think it says how, how much about the refereeing standards in Scotland. And I actually think Beaton's maybe one of the better ones sometimes. Um, yeah. But when that's the case, you know the problem. Yeah, it's um, it's very true. I, I guess as well. Um, the draw, of course, we're we're doing this episode on Monday lunchtime, so. The draw for the next round has oh, wow. um, yet to take place. The, the draw takes place after Morton uh, against Harps. Um, Callum, um, if you're still there and can can hear me, is there a preference for who you want to face in the semi-final or not caring? Good to see Callum's gone away right before the preview of the Dundee game. Um, in terms of... the the, the draw for me, avoid Rangers, purely based off of what we saw from the officiating yesterday. Celtic look as bad as us right now. Um, and thankfully, both teams have no opportunity to improve their standing. Um, so for me, in terms of the, the Scottish Cup, I would kind of weirdly take Celtic. Um, but yes, I think we have to... Uh, agree that Morton would be the ideal draw uh, at this stage ahead of tonight's um, draw. Callum, welcome back. Would you agree with that? 
Um, yeah, I don't know what you're saying. Um, were you saying that so, um, that you prefer Celtic probably over Rangers, however Morton would be ideal? Is that what you're saying? Correct, pretty much, yeah. Yes, I, I would agree with that. It's so annoying. It was going so well, and then <laughs> it was. I got booted out. It's it all was. Right about that, um, no, it's all right. Um, it'll look seamless in the audio, of course. Um, and some exciting mm. changes for um, this podcast coming up on audio as well. Um, more of that in a couple of weeks' time. Um, one thing going into the Dundee game, Calm, I spoke about the game against Kilmarnock being season-defining and a win potentially giving us momentum and opportunity to build on that ahead of some quite important games ahead, ahead of the international break. Will the weekend's result give those players that bounce going into Wednesday night? I hope so. It's certainly given me a little bit of a bounce. Um, and you think, you know, the fact they've got another semi-final on the horizon, they'll all want to be competing for places in terms of, you know, in, in training and, and in matches. People want to prove themselves, deserve, show why they deserve that chance in the semi-final. And, and I think it just gives everyone... A bit of a lift. I mean, the atmosphere at Pretoria, although it was a smaller crowd, I thought was absolutely excellent on Saturday. Um, the red shed looked like it had sort of more involvement, sort of out with the, the sort of centre block. Mm. Um, the south stand were a, a bit more up for it. Obviously, winning helps, certainly. Um, but it felt like it gave us a lift. And I think the players getting that reception back as well could give mm-hmm. them, them a lift. And it's something... You know, a little bit of a distraction from our terrible league form, and they can take confidence from that performance. Uh, a side that come on, well, a side that we've not done well against in the league. We bullied them, a very convincing and deserved victory. Um, and w- why not try and carry that on into the league? And you just hope that they can. Yeah, and I hope so too. But obviously, Dundee coming into this fixture in midweek off the back of a free weekend, um, but also probably looking to right some wrongs from the last time out when they also faced the same opposition as we did, um, chucking a 2-1 lead against 10 men, Kilmarnock late on. Uh, again, Dundee and late goals, two things going hand in hand this season. Tony Doherty was in attendance at Pataudry to cast his eye over the Dons and I'm sure will have picked up one or two things um, from the game. I guess with a <clears throat> trip to Dens, Calm, one thing we know is the pitch is going to be heavy. Uh, or shite, I should say, um, especially with kind of forecast over the next couple of days to include rain. Um, so potential to have a kind of heavy pitch impact the legs and squad rotation and utilising the bench may be something that is a factor for Peter Levin going into this game. It would be certainly interesting what sort of lineup or shape even Peter Levin does go into this game with as well. Um I think, if I remember correctly, Dundee have got rid of their um, groundsman, however, and perhaps yeah. got a new one in. So hopefully that'll help in the pitch. It's been enough time for the pitch to get in better condition despite the rain. Um, it would be, I, you know, there's a part of me that's expecting the game not even to go ahead just because of <laughs> previous this season. But let's hope that's not the case. Um, it'll be interesting to see how we shape up and um, I, I was hoping there'd be a new manager in the stand or a prospective new manager in the stand watching. However, that won't be the case. Um, but off the back off the back of that victory, they've got to take confidence, and I hope leaving doesn't change all that much from from Saturday. And um, mm. obviously, we'll have you know the fact it's a midweek game. The fact the pitch might be heavy to take into account. But I'd be certainly happy for us to go with the same starting eleven as we did against Kilmarnock uh, against Dundee. Yeah, no, uh, agree. I'm disappointed there's been no kind of exclusives from Scott Burns or, or Ryan Krill about who the potential um, new manager could could be or kind of insights into into goings on um, behind the scenes for once. Um, things seem to be fairly watertight um, for, for news coming out of of, of Pataudry, which which makes a, a change. I, I guess with with this game coming up as well. In terms of a positive mindset on on the back of the, the weekend's victory, this is an opportunity for us to kind of continue to hang on to Hibbs' coattails in the race for top six. For those still on the mindset, we could sneak into the top six, given the fact that um, looking towards the weekend, Dundee face Rangers. Um, we ourselves 
uh, travel to Motherwell uh, and Hibs play Livingston. But if there's any team probably could trust less than us, it, it, it's Hibs. Um, Hibs, of course, also in action in midweek uh, in their game in hand uh, against Ross County. So, you know, still kind of all to play for. Uh, and David McLennan pretty much right here and saying, all things considered, we really need three points on Wednesday. Those three points on Wednesday would keep that league season interesting and also dependent on the result from Dingwall further um, boost our hopes of survival or avoiding the playoff, I should probably say. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we need three points, uh, whether you're looking up or down the table, mm-hmm. essentially. Yeah. <laughs> um, it could be a massive boost. I mean, if we are going to seek into that top six, Dundee, I want to say, we're going to have to leap from. Um, and uh, I don't know, we need to win games between now and the new manager coming in. If we are going to have a chance of getting into that top six, and if you do get in the top six, then who knows what could happen from there. Um, but I'm maybe getting a bit carried away, given given you know the fact we won a game. Ultimately, let's not get fucking relegated and just win on Wednesday. Yeah, it's not like you to ever get carried away on this podcast at all. Um, Dundee, of course, do have the the capability um, within their squad to hurt us. We've seen it, especially at set plays. Um, already this season as well. Um, Luke McCowan, certainly a, a player in their midfield that will look to provide a creative spark. And I think kind of the combination of some of their creative players mixed with the inconsistencies uh, in our defence, I should say, um, probably mean that this game is going to see goals. Q nil nil. now that I've said that. Um, but in terms of uh, an Aberdeen personnel, we both kind of agreed that we would like to see the same starting eleven that that played against Kilmarnock. But if you're Peter Levin and contemplating any changes, what area of the pitch um, do you see any changes being made? Oh God, I, I really hope none of them, um, <laughs> because the players will be confident that started that game against Kilmarnock. Um, perhaps maybe brings in Duke for McGrath or or, or Hoylett. You would. You would probably think, but it would feel very, very harsh for any changes, let alone that one when those two performed particularly well. Mm-hmm. Um, Clarkson, perhaps for Killian Phillips, but I would prefer Killian Phillips. I think he gives it a little bit more bite in there, a little bit more um, grit rather than Clarkson for all Clarkson's um, technical abilities, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, or maybe perhaps for Connor Barron, Leighton Clarkson. Um, that's the only places I can really see any potential changes. However, I prefer for there just to be none. Um, yeah. Because they were all so good on Saturday. Keep that going. Don't tinker with it. If it's not broken, don't fix it. And it's been very broken this season, but <laughs> it worked on Saturday. So don't, don't, don't fix it. Yeah, I would certainly like to see the back four left alone. Just keep them... You know, going as is McDonald and Garton. And yes, they made the, the mistake against St. Johnson at home and not had the mistakes against St. Minnan. But the more they play with each other, the more they get used to each other's game, that that will come in time. We're just still making too much changes that's not going to inspire any confidence um, amongst them. I do agree that you'd probably be looking at the forward areas like Sakillian Phillips, Junior Hoylet on any potential kind of areas that we see change. And I'm guessing for the likes of Junior Hoyle, it's potentially three games in a week this week coming up. How, how will a, a player that's not had many minutes cope with that? Killian Phillips, again, gives us that physical approach. I thought he was excellent in trying to get us up the pitch from from throw-ins. Him and Danny Armstrong seem to have a running battle all weekend um, on that. He seems like a complete nutter, and, and I think he'd go absolutely crazy if he scores for for Aberdeen, um, as well. But yeah, he just adds that little bit of a almost like a little bit of a prick to our team, a, a player that's not yeah. afraid to kind of get in the face of the opposition and not care what they think, which is again something that this team has massively lacked, not just this season but over the years, um, as well. So if there was to be a change, I, I kind of in agreement, probably one or two. I don't see there being wholesale changes. Um, hopefully though we get ourselves in the position come 60-70 minutes where we can then offload the bench uh, and give players um, you know, a little bit of rest ahead of the, the weekend's game against Motherwell. Now that's optimistic because you thought I was getting guided away. <laughs> the fact we're going to have things wrapped up by 70 minutes. <laughs> Dearie me, Glenn, are you yeah. pissed? 
for it then to all collapse in the last 20 minutes and then come on here and there'll be another rant about why the manager shouldn't have changed things and why we should have already had an interim lined up before Peter Levin took charge. But, yeah. of course, Peter Levin um, already had one game in charge of the Dons this season, a 1-1 draw um, against Celtic, so I'm sure he'll be eager to go out and prove um, that he can continue his unbeaten run as Aberdeen manager. Imagine he just starts winning every game and we just end up with another Robson situation. <laughs> I think he's made it abundantly clear to the board that he would rather stay in the background than be the man in, in charge. So uh, we don't need to worry about that too much. But Callum, it's been good to get you back on the podcast today, um, despite Thank your you. technical glitch a little bit earlier on. Um, just one in one this week for you because you're working on Thursday evening. So one of Phil Mayer or Jay Moyer will return to the co-host seat on Thursday evening. I know the Marniacs will be desperate to see the return of Phil. Um, so I'll be joined by somebody on Thursday evening to look back at Wednesday night's events at Dens Park and then preview the trip to Fur Park at the weekend. And who knows, maybe have some more chat on the um, upcoming managerial appointment at Pataudry as well. So stay yeah. tuned for that. Stay tuned to our social media channels as well for some, as we said, some upcoming news regarding the audio and um, broadcasts of this podcast as well. If you've been watching here on YouTube with us live or on catch up, remember to like the video, subscribe wherever you are tuning in if it's audio or video. And until next time, thanks very much for joining and comment.